you might as well just work for the man again, because if you're not working on what you really enjoy, what you really like to do, then why keep doing it? Hello and welcome back to Indie Bites, a podcast where I bring you stories of fellow indie hackers in 15 minutes or less. Today I'm joined by Joe Mazzalotti, the founder of Rails Devs, a reverse job board for Ruby on Rails developers, which is on just over 4k MRR and on for 100k revenue this year. Joe also runs the Hotwire Dev newsletter, which has over 2,000 subs. Then late last year, Joe sold his side project Mudshot Bot, which he took from idea to sale in just 14 months. Now, Joe is one of my good friends, and we actually met through a community you know is close to my heart, Ramen Club. If I hadn't have met Joe, I'd never have heard his story, and this podcast episode would never have happened. So I'm super grateful that a community like Ramen Club exists. And although Ramen Club is paying to sponsor the pod, I don't think you can fake relationships like this. It comes from real connections facilitated by the events run by the community. So if you want to meet people like Joe and help take your project to ramen profitability, join the community at ramenclub.so and use code IndieBytes to get 50% off your first month. Links are in the show notes. Now, let's hear about Joe's journey. Joe, how are you? Welcome to the pod. I am doing great. Thanks for having me, James. So Joe, when we first met, you started a cool little project called Mugshot Bot, and I loved this. <laughs> and it got to around $200 MRR, and then you, you sold it a few months later. What was your process from starting it, making the decision when the revenue wasn't going quite well to either park it or sell it? Well, first of all, thank you. You were my first paying customer. So that was super exciting to see on, on Weekend Club at the time. Now, yeah, now, yeah. now Ramen Club, I believe, right? Yeah, so Mugshot Bot created OG images for your blog. And that was like kind of it. That was the beauty of it. It was so simple. Mm -hmm. And it came from a time where I was blogging way more frequently and would always go to publish my, my, my post and be like, oh crap, I have to make one of those stupid images for Twitter. And it would take me like way too long because I would like go on Canva and like try to get inspired and go on Unsplash and try to find some generic. And I was like, this is so silly. Can I, can I just automate this? It got me to a point where I was like, okay, this is probably useful for other people. So I started sharing with other people, started charging for it, got it up to, like you said, about 200 something MRR and put this on kind of like autopilot for a while. Yeah. It wasn't growing. It wasn't shrinking. Churn pretty much equaled new revenue, but people were happy. People were using it on their blog. It still exists in the world today. And the problem though, was that I got bored. Yeah. It was stagnant in a way because it was stagnant in my mind. I wanted to work on something new. It didn't feel like I could grow this into a bigger platform unless I wanted to compete with Banner Bear. So I thought that it was not as big as it could be, but it was as big as I could get it. So I threw it up for sale on MicroAcquire. MicroAcquire has this awesome tool. You connect to Stripe and you get like a valuation. And my, they evaluated my mugshot bot at like a pretty healthy number. And I was like, okay, I'd be happy with selling it for this. I think within like a month, I had closed the, closed the sale. It was it was very, very quick. And obviously, you know, we're not, we're not talking life-changing amounts of money here, but enough money that I was able to get a new computer, get my wife a new computer and, you know, kickstart my next adventure, which would end up being Rails devs. But what was so appealing about a product yeah. with like such low revenue, uh, the, the customer base, everyone who used it was like, this is so amazing. I don't have to worry about anything. I can just set it and forget it and it's good. And they'll happily keep paying. I shared that with them. I shared a bunch of testimonials and anecdotal information and they were excited to take it on and excited to continue to grow it. That is a really good reflection. Very interesting because you built a good product. You got paying customers. The customers were really happy with that product, but then it just stagnated. And that wasn't the fault of the product. It was just you were not spending the time on it because it didn't excite you. Yeah. I, and I think that there's a lot of shame in, in the indie hackers culture in kind of just stopping working on something because it no longer interests you. And I don't think that that's how we should think about stuff, especially in the indie hacker space where you might be trying 10 product projects a year and seeing which sticks. I'm way more for following your passion and your excitement with projects, because if you don't, you might as well just work for the man again and go work for someone else. Because if you're not working on what you really enjoy, what you really like to do, then why keep doing it? Now, Joe, you, you, you're quite a technical guy. We were just chatting earlier. I don't really know what you do so can you quickly <laughs> so people have some context yeah explain what you do as this technical person yeah so i do this weird kind of very niche space called turbo native it helps 
Ruby on Rails apps get ported to your iOS, like to your iPhone essentially, so you can deploy in the App Store. And then I do all of the development for, for Rails devs. I'm a solo founder there. So let's go into Rails devs then. So tell me why a reverse jobs board and how it started with the spreadsheet. About a year ago, I was working with a few clients and, and more, more inbound leads were happening for my Rails consultancy and just couldn't work with everyone and wanted to help them, but didn't really know where to refer them to. So I started reaching out to people on Twitter and was like, hey, I know you do freelancing. When are you available? What type of projects do you like to work on? And literally created like a spreadsheet. Like it was a Google sheet, multiple developers on it, and just started sharing it with businesses that wanted to work with me. And within like a month, I had gotten people two or three freelance jobs. Someone got a full-time job from it. And I was like, there's something here. If I'm referring people, I'm creating my own little network of, of, of Rails developers. Why can't this be an automated business that I'm also making a profit off of because it's a business, but helping more people and not just helping the people that I know in my network, but helping every Rails developer out there find their next job. And I think, uh, you know, a week later, I, I made my first commit to Rails devs and started getting people to sign up. How did you get that out into the world of the spreadsheet? Was it just Twitter? The spreadsheet was built from talking to people directly on Twitter. So asking people for where their availability was. I never shared the spreadsheet publicly because I was worried about sharing people's like email addresses and yeah. their skill level without their permission, which has also kind of encouraged me to make it more official where they could add their own, you know, their own information to the website. It got me thinking a lot on a, there's probably something here business wise, but also after talking to a bunch of rails developers specifically about getting hired and finding their next job, a lot of them really, really hated it. And just like, didn't like the whole process of having an up-to-date resume, having to apply, mm. hoping someone would get back to you, whiteboarding for hours, days, and then just never hearing back. Right. So rails devs is built around this idea of empowering the independent developer. So this is perfectly reflected in how on Rails devs, like you said, it's a reverse job board. You don't apply to jobs. You post your profile, companies reach out to you if they think you're qualified, and then you're off to the races. So talk growth to me, Joe. How mm -hmm. did you take Rails devs from this spreadsheet to this product to then building out this marketplace and generating revenue? It being a marketplace creates that classic chicken or the egg problem of yeah. which side do you build first? If you don't have any developers, no businesses want to sign up. If you don't have anyone hiring, how do you get developers to join? And the way that I tackle that is I focus my marketing 100% on the Rails developer. I talk about the benefits of the platform to the developer, how it's better for developers, how the power is in their shoes. When I build in public on Twitter, it's always about what can I do to make this a better experience for the Rails developer? And that inherently has organic appeal to developers signing up. Uh, at this point, I'm getting two to three develop new developers on the site every single day. And, you know, that compounds. That's, I'm at 500 something plus developers on the site. Like, it's crazy. By doing that, I'm able to build out a huge portfolio of folks that are ready to be hired, which makes talking to businesses a little bit easier. It was how I kind of solved the chicken or the egg. I went for the side of the marketplace that wants to get hired, that gets more value out of it, and then went for the people that happen to pay for it second. Yeah, well, that seems really bizarre to me. Like, I, I, the rationale makes sense, but I am now thinking, why would you put so much more effort on the ones that don't pay than the ones mm -hmm. that make your business work? Yeah. So the way I think about it is... There's two scenarios. I have a thousand developers and no businesses, or I have 15 paying businesses and no developers. If there's 15 paying businesses and no developers, they're not going to stick around very long. However, if there are hundreds of developers on the website who create their profile and maybe let it sit for a few months with the intention that in the future they'll get reached out to, that's a way better scenario to be in. And I can go to a business and say, hey, there are 500 developers looking to get hired. Do you want to join? That's a much easier sell than, hey, can you pay me 300 bucks a month and maybe someone will join in the future that'll be a good fit? Is there any specific tactics you use to like get those developers on the platform and then to grow traffic to the site? Yeah, I have a couple techniques for getting developers and I have a couple techniques for getting businesses. And for getting developers, it's a lot of from building in public, 
talking about the problems that I face with Rails devs from a technical standpoint and getting folks interested in the project and sometimes even contributing themselves on GitHub. What I think the biggest thing though is that I am very much tapped into the Rails community and the Rails ecosystem. Yeah. I, I'm giving talks, I'm going to conferences, I have my newsletter, I have my blog, I'm, I'm in multiple discords, multiple Slack channels, and that is where I'm able to be embedded into the community. And people know that when they see my name, they're going to hear about Rails devs or they already know about it. For the business side, it's a little bit trickier. It always kind of sounds a little salesy when I try to pitch this to someone, and mm. that's I understand that. It's been a lot of manual outreach, you know, looking over job boards, building in public, hoping for inbound leads. So it'll see how that grows more organically in the future. So let's talk about how you get paid for this. Um, you've got the recurring revenue companies pay you 300 bucks a month and you've got the hiring fees. Yeah. So the companies pay $300 a month to be part of the platform that gets them access to all of the developers hidden information, like their contact info, their social links, their real name, the project that they worked on, stuff like that, that actually makes it val valuable to message someone and reach out to them. When you hire someone that you reached out to through the platform, you're also required to pay a 10% hiring fee on their first year salary. The hiring fee is what made Rails devs go from a nice little side project to something that is a good portion of my income now. And that's really exciting because it encourages just so much more effort to put into this. Like when I'm making, <laughs> you know, money that is that is starting to be life changing through this platform, I'm able to devote more and more time to it to make it better for both sides. Why I charge a hiring fee? Yes, you're doing a lot of the elbow work. You're getting in there and, and messaging developers and doing your searching. Mm. But I, I'm here to help you every step of the way. If you need a list of developers that fit your criteria, sure, here's 15 devs that you could reach out to. You need some help tweaking your, your outgoing message, your cold outreach. Yeah, send it over. We'll look at it together. If you're not sure what offer package, like I'm, I'm there every step of the way but I'm not a recruiter. I'm not going to be vetting candidates for you. I'm not going to be scheduling interviews. And that's why I'm only charging 10% and not the 20, 30, or 40% sometimes that tech um, industry recruiters will charge for finding you you know, a candidate. That makes a complete sense. And that 300 bucks a month, seems a bit strange that someone would get a subscription for finding devs to hire. Do you do a package where they look like buy it for a month when they're doing their recruiting drive or like how are you dealing with stuff like churn? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So churn is high and that's good. I encourage churn. The 10% hiring fee is incentive for me to get you as a business, a developer as quickly as possible. 300 bucks a month is not that significant when I could be making $10,000 or $20,000 off of a, an amazing hire, you know, at 200 K. So by having the monthly fee and the hiring fee attached, I'm able to focus on the best outcome for both parties, getting you a developer and getting hired as quickly as possible, getting you into the platform. And when you're done, get out of the platform, churn all you want, graduate from rails devs. Yeah. I am excited because we made a success story right there. We got you a developer. I don't need your $300 a month for the rest of the year because like, you're locked into a yearly subscription. No. <laughs> Sign up for two months, find someone and get out. And we'll talk again when you hire again in six months. Like, that's totally fine. Refreshing approach. I love it. Let's talk about Hotwire Dev Newsletter. <laughs> Joe, this is awesome. I'm in awe of you finding opportunities and just executing on them. You really are an executor. And you've grown this newsletter in a niche that I never knew existed to over 2,300 subs now. How did you do it? What made you want to start this newsletter and commit to doing something monthly like this? So I've always wanted to do a newsletter since I started my blog. And I felt like I never had enough content for it. And I started, I tried, I had the Maserati monthly, you know, every month I would send out a newsletter and it lasted, I think three months. And I was like, I I'm out of stuff to talk about. I was looking for something where I could, it could be more of a collection of links and I could offer commentary on it instead of me having to write new content every month. And I stumbled into Hotwire because I'm a big, a huge fan of how it works in the Rails ecosystem. So I started collecting links and kind of keeping them in notion. And then I was like, well, this is, be this is really interesting. Why am I not sharing this with people? So I did a huge Twitter thread on like all of the links that I had collected and people were like, this is great. I can't, I'm so excited. And then was like, cool, copy and paste it into a newsletter and sent it out the next day and started sharing it and have kind of grown organically since then. Yeah. I, I think this is where niche really helps because mm -hmm. you are filling a gap, which is just completely empty. And there is a community of people 
that want this content that is really specific and it takes a very certain type of person to <laughs> curate these links and put the effort in to make it. So it doesn't have to be a hugely complex idea, but it's just executed well in that niche. And that's what you've done well with the newsletter. So good work, man. Well, Joe, you know that I end every episode on three recommendations, a book, a podcast and an indie hacker from you. So my book is Obviously Awesome by April Dunford. It is my go-to book on positioning. Podcast, I've been really getting into the business of authority. It is two folks who have authority-based businesses where they do like consulting and advisory type roles. Super interesting. Um, Indie Hacker is Colleen Schnettler. She is the co-founder of Simple File Upload and Hammerstone.dev. Jay, great recommendations. Thank you for joining me for this episode. Thanks, James. It was an absolute pleasure to be here. I loved it, and I'm super excited to hear it come out. Absolutely, dude. Cheerio. Thank you for listening to this episode of Indie Buys. All links to everything discussed will be in the show notes. As always, a thank you to today's sponsor, Ramen Club, where you can meet people like Joe. And finally, if you have a podcast but editing takes up all of your time, drop me a message to help you out. I run a podcast editing service called Podpanda to help you get your time back and fire up your production value. That's all from me. See you next week. <laughs>